Once in a while, you'll get an incomplete freight car, like this refrigerator car, along with a batch of other cars. Is there anything that could be done with a car like this? Welcome back to my channel, and as always, thanks to my subscribers. This refrigerator car was included with six other used freight cars. As you can see, it has no underframe, no weights, no trucks, and no couplers. These might seem to be fatal flaws, but if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that the first thing I do with a used car is to replace the trucks and the couplers. So the only extra step I need to do for this car is to build a replacement underframe. This car was likely sold by AHM. A nearly identical car, even down to the road number, was sold by IHC. The IHC car had black ends. As you can see, this car has yellow ends. The original car was almost certainly equipped with truck mounted couplers. You can see that there is no space for a coupler pocket in the car ends. This central tab probably snapped into the original underframe. There is a small lip on the inside of the car body where the body rests on the underframe. That lip is 5 seconds of an inch from the bottom of the car body. The notches at the car ends are 1 8 inch deep. So ideally, I'd like to insert a floor which is 1 32nd inches thick. That would make the bottom of the car floor flush with the end notches. I have no styrene that is 1 32nd inches thick, but I do have a sheet of 30 thousandths inch styrene, which is just 1 and a quarter 1 thousandths thinner than 1 32nd. I cut a sheet to fit inside the car body. The fit needs to be pretty snug, so I measure and cut carefully. Next, I remove the tabs from the ends of the car. The easiest way to remove these is by using the dibbling cutter from Micromark. This tool will cut plastic up to about 60 thousandths of an inch thick. It also leaves cut edges that require very little cleanup. After removing the tabs, I inserted the car floor in the body and carefully trimmed the cutouts in the car ends until they were flush with the bottom of the floor. The bottom of the floor will become the coupler mounting surface, and this needs to be 29 64ths of an inch from the top of the rails. I check the fit by placing an assembled coupler in the car end cutouts, which are now the coupler pockets. Now it's time to begin building the underframe. I started by cementing a styrene pad at each end of the car on top of the car floor. This will make the floor thickness 60 thousandths of an inch or almost 1 16th of an inch. This will provide better support for the coupler mounting screws. Next, I marked the center line on the underside of the floor and located and marked the center lines of the bolsters three quarters of an inch from each end of the car. You can see that I've also marked the A and B ends of the underframe. At this point, it's totally arbitrary, but this will help me keep things oriented properly later on. I used a square to be sure the bolsters were perpendicular to the car center line. I'm using Titchy Bolsters number 3069 for this car. If you prefer, you can build up your own bolsters using styrene. I don't know if it is by good fortune or by careful design, but the height of the Accurail truck is 0.291 inches and the Titchy Bolster is 0.162 inches high. This places the coupler mounting surface 0.453 inches above the rail, exactly 29 sixty-fourths of an inch. Next, I fashioned a central support beam by gluing a 3 sixteenths inch wide strip of 10 thousandths inch thick styrene to one face of a piece of 1 eighth inch square styrene. Once the central support beam had dried, I drilled a hole at a 45 degree angle to allow the train line to pass through the support beam. At this point I stopped recording video. The next steps are not difficult, but they require enough precision that my hands and tools completely blocked any reasonable view of the process. Here is the completed underframe ready for painting. You can see that I have glued the bolsters and the central support beam in place here, with cross ribs on either side of the support beam in these six places. I fabricated the cross ribs using lengths of 20 thousandths by 100 thousandths styrene strip for the webs and 10 thousandths by 60 thousandths styrene strip for the flanges. I drilled holes in three of the webs, then I glued the flanges to the webs. 
Once the cross ribs were dry, I glued them in place, spacing them evenly and aligning them as best I could. Be sure the webs with the drilled holes are located here, here, and here. These holes will allow you to install the train line. I used 20 thousandths inch phosphor bronze wire for the train line. I always install the train line as two separate lengths of wire. This makes it much easier to get the train line threaded through the holes in the webs of the cross ribs and into the hole in the central support beam. As you can see, even though it is two separate pieces, the train line appears to be a continuous pipe. I glued the ends of the train line into the support beam with super glue and left the outside ends hanging free. Next I installed the AB brake components. I did not bother to model the rest of the air piping or the mechanical linkage. These details are not very visible on refrigerator cars or box cars. Finally, I used a number 50 drill bit to drill coupler mounting holes and truck mounting holes in the underframe. Then I used a number 2 by 56 tap to tap the holes for the truck and coupler mounting screws. All that is left is to paint the underframe and it would be ready for installation. I had already removed the running board, as you see here, and removed the cast on stirrup steps. The brake wheel was firmly attached, so I did not try to remove it. I have gotten a number of comments and questions on previous videos about stripping paint from models before repainting. Since I am lazy, and since stripping paint is a messy step, I generally only strip paint for any one of three reasons. First, when the original paint job is very heavy or uneven. Second, when I am concerned that the new paint will not easily cover the old paint. And third, when I need to glue plastic parts onto the original car body. In this case, I can see that the black paint on the roof of the car has been applied very heavily, so I reluctantly decided to strip the paint before proceeding. As seen in the video refurbishing an inexpensive passenger car, I use 99% isopropyl alcohol to strip paint. I soak the car in the alcohol for about 30 minutes and scrub the old paint off with an old toothbrush. In over 50 years of model railroading, I've never encountered paint this stubborn. After soaking the car for three weeks, I finally resorted to using double-lot steel wool to scrub off the paint. As you can see, even that didn't remove all of the paint, so I had to finish scraping the old paint off with my number 11 blade. As you watch me scrape the paint away from the cast-on ice hatches, notice that the hatches are incorrectly oriented. Ice hatches always open toward the ends of the car. This allows the hatches to be propped open while the car is moving to force airflow across the ice and through the car, thus keeping the car contents cool. If I were detailing this car, I would cut off the hatches and install new ones in the correct orientation. The alcohol had softened the paint enough to make this scraping possible, but it still took a lot of effort to get to this point. With the old paint removed, I added four tabs to the inside of the car body to serve as retaining clips. I used short lengths of Evergreen number 125, 20 thousandths by 100 thousandths inch strip, cemented flush with the bottom of the car body and spaced to fit between the cross ribs. After a quick check to be sure the underframe would snap into position, I sanded the bottom edges of the retaining clips to form an incline. This will make it easier to insert the underbody. When all four clips had been sanded, I tested the fit. As you can see, the underframe snaps into position perfectly. Next, I turned my attention to the stirrup steps. This car will use three different styles of stirrup steps. The right ends of the car, the latter ends, will need bottom mount angled offset steps. The left end of the car will need side mount angled offset steps and the car centers will need side mount slant steps. I sanded the remaining nubs off of the car bottom. Then I removed the cast on side stirrup mounts. This just takes a little patience, a number 17 X-Acto small chisel blade, and some 1200 grit sandpaper. Once I'd cleaned off the mounting surface, I drilled new mounting holes. The side mount steps need a number 78 drill bit and the bottom mount steps need a number 73 drill bit. 
The walls of the car body are only slightly thicker than a number 73 drill bit, so drill these holes very carefully. Before I attached the syrup steps, I drilled holes for the roof corner grabs using a number 79 drill bit. Then I glued the grabs in place with a little super glue. The roof grabs are just slightly less fragile than the stirrup steps, so I installed them first. To mount the stirrup steps, I put a dab of super glue accelerator in each hole, dipped the stirrup step pins in the super glue, and then placed the stirrup step in position. Using accelerator means I only had to hold the step in position for a second or two while the glue sets. Now it was time to prime and paint. As usual, I painted the underbody with Rust-Oleum 2X Painter's Touch Flat Black Primer. Then I highlighted the underbody details by painting them a rust color. I primed the car body with Tamiya Fine Spray Primer in light gray. When the primer had cured, I painted the car sides reefer yellow. I used Scale Coat 2 paint, which is no longer available, but True Color makes a reefer yellow paint. Also remember that reefer yellow is not a standard color. You can use any suitable bright yellow color. Use multiple spray passes to build up the color, moving the spray quickly across the model. After allowing the yellow paint to cure at least 24 hours and preferably 48 hours, I masked off the car sides in preparation for painting the roofs and ends. I used Tamiya masking tape for this job. Be careful to get a clean, sharp edge on the tape where the car sides adjoin the car ends and seal the tape firmly. Before you spray the roof color, spray all the tape edges with reefer yellow. This will seal the edges of the tape and prevent the roof color from wicking onto the car sides. After the seal coat has dried, you can spray the roof and ends. I used Scale Coat 2 Boxcar Red simply because I had it on hand but True Color has a roof brown paint, which would work nicely. As you can see, in spite of its name, the Scale Coat Boxcar Red is a medium brown. After the roof color has cured, carefully remove the masking tape, taking care not to disturb the stirrup steps. If your spray paint has a gloss finish, you can apply decals as soon as the paint is cured. If not, you'll need to apply a clear gloss coat to provide a good service for applying decals. Apply the gloss coat just as you would apply paint. Quick strokes of spray across the entire model, slowly building an even coat. I searched through my collection of refrigerator decals and found several possibilities for this car. To my great surprise, I found this set from Champ Decals, Morel Refrigerator. Comparing this decal set with the original car, it appears that the car manufacturer relied on the artwork provided by Champ Decals to paint their model. They even used the same road number. Although I did notice that the manufacturer managed to misspell the word lessee. I thought it was fitting to return this car to its roots. Champ Decals are no longer in production, but you might find another set for sale on eBay and at swap meets. If you prefer, all of the larger decal suppliers have a selection of refrigerator car decals. I'll provide links to some likely choices in the description below this video. And here is the finished car with decals installed and a final overspray of doll coat. Obviously this car still needs to be weathered, but that's a project for another day. Notice that I've painted the wheels using grimy black instead of rust red. I've had feedback from several viewers noting that the old style packed journal boxes were constantly leaking oil and this oil produced a grimy black coating on the wheel faces. I'll let you compare these trucks to the trucks I've installed on my other freight cars and decide which one you prefer. If you go to the community tab on my YouTube channel homepage, I have added an image poll where you can vote for the wheel color you prefer. I have included links to all the products mentioned in this video in the description below. As always, I would love to hear your comments and questions. If you want to see more videos of this type, be sure to subscribe and hit that like button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.